Thank you for coming. This is one of a whole suite of programs that Bridge Projects is hosting. A word or two about Bridge Projects and these kinds of programs. Um, Bridge Projects exists to display contemporary artwork, in this case, Philip K. Smith III. It's quite an exceptional piece and definitely worth coming to see in a quieter setting without chairs and lighting equipment. <laughs> um, but we not only exhibit these beautiful works, but we also present um, a suite of programming that can offer different lenses through which you can see the work and, and have an enriched experience with it. Um, from this perspective of art history, spirituality, and religious traditions. Um, and you can look at a list of various programs we've already done. Um, we are grateful for the support of the Amundsens in this endeavor. Um, we have a wonderful team. Kara Megan Lewis is another director along with myself. I'm Linnea Spranzi, one of the directors. Um, we have Vicki Smith, who's head of client relations, and Michael Wright, who is Instagramming away, <laughs> and head of communications. Um, I love that people are heads of departments despite the fact that they are just themselves. We need a shoulder of a certain department. We need a elbow, you know, we need all those parts. But regardless, these human beings are very talented and we're grateful for them. And um, we are going to be in for a treat tonight. And Kara is going to introduce Lita for us. Um, so without further ado, here you are. Thanks, Linnea. Welcome, first of all. Um, as Linnea said, this is the third event in this, our series called Light in Sacred Space. In October, Michael Govan started us off, generously offering insight to artworks created by Dan Flavin, leading up to the artist's final commission, an immersive light installation in, at a chapel in Milan. Um, in November, archaeologist Dr. Ronald Falsight, who's also in the audience tonight, <laughs> led us from an ancient passage tomb in Ireland to columns of light in ancient caves of Mexico. Both of these talks are on our website, by the way. Um, today we're continuing this conversation on light and space across millennia with the beloved artist Lita Albuquerque. Given the depth, the deep realms that Lita plumbs in her work, we are guaranteed to be taken to places as expansive as the cosmos and as intimate as the heart. In fact, on one of the nights leading up to this talk, I dreamt upon giving this very introduction <laughs> that the gravitational pull weakened on my feet. After several attempts at resisting, I gave in and floated upside down above the audience. <laughs> this is the kind of effect her work can have on those who witness it. So, with my feet pl firmly planted on the ground tonight, I'm honored to in introduce installation environmental artist, painter, and sculptor, sculptor Lita Albuquerque. Lita was born in Santa Monica, California, and raised in Tunisia, North Africa, and Paris, France. At the age of 11, she settled with her family in the U.S. In the 1970s, Albuquerque emerged on the California art scene as part of the light and space movement and won acclaim for her epic and poetic ephemeral pigment pieces created for desert sites. Her site-specific practice has yielded projects in places as central as the Washington Monument and as far-flung as the Great Pyramids. Locally, she has graced such places as Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels, where she created celestial disc, a star map, sculpture, and waterfall. In 2006, Lita led an expedition to Antarctica near the south <clears throat> near the South Pole to create the first installment of her global work, Stellar Access, the first and largest ephemeral artwork created on the continent. These works, while primarily experienced by an audience through photographs, create tangible bridge to that which seems so very unfathomable, space infinite and time eternal. So coincidentally, Linnea and I both saw Lita's work for the very first time in 2017, the biennial Desert X, on the same day that we also met Philip III, whose installation, Tin Columns, is around you now. 
it turned out to be a very auspicious day in the desert. The piece that Lita developed for the event was titled Hearth, lowercase h, Earth, on the grounds of Sunnylands, the former home of ambassadors Walter and Leonore Annenberg, a figure painted in, in Lita's signature ultramarine lay in repose on a circular field of crushed marble. The figure's ear was to the ground. At first, we did not know if the figure was a sculpture or a live person, and in the end, that didn't matter. The presence was palpable, and we sat around the hearth, as you might around a fireplace at home. And we simply sat and listened to the listening. This sculpture, molded from the body of her daughter Jasmine, was one of the many artworks that Lita lost in the Woolsey that took her home, her library, and decades of writing and innumerable, innumerable hours of work last November. What emerged from experiencing such profound loss was an understanding of the importance of her personal archive, of her authentic voice, recorded in decades of journals spared from the fire. Lita recently read a selection of these writings to an audience at the Philosophical Research Society who hosted an event to help Lita rebuild her library. The deeply personal writings revealed Lita's own intimate connection to realms beyond human understanding as she received messages from a place and time outside of the here and now. Seated in that auditorium, I found myself again, listening to the listening. And with that, I will take my seat and listen with you. Please join me in welcoming Lita Albuquerque. Thank you, Carr. Am I, am I plugged in? Yes. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm, I'm delighted for this audience, who are mainly my friends, and it's so fantastic to see everybody here and to be in this space and to be speaking about sacred space and light. And um, I, I want to begin with the idea that, that we, in fact, are sacred space, that um, we embody sacred space. But now is the time, 2020 is the time to understand that we are sacred space. Um, there's a wonderful cultural historian, his name is Thomas Berry, and he talks about how we're at the end of the story, we're at the end of the story that we've been living off of for the last 2,000 years, and that it's no longer viable, and that the story now is of us in the cosmos. And he talks about three universal laws the first one is of our diversity and of our multiplicity, that each one of us, each thing, not just human being, but each entity, each, um, even the idea of light um, or a galaxy or a cell is completely unique. The second one, which I'd never really thought about on that kind of scale, is that every thing like that, light, a cloud, a human being, an animal, a planet, a galaxy, has an interiority that is continually in need of expressing itself. So it's not, not a need, it continually expresses itself. And the third one is through, through both those things, it, it, we're, that we're interconnected through that multi, that multi diversity and the, the constant um, subjectivity of who we are expressing ourselves. So I feel that 2020, I, I, I did a project in um, 2016 called 2020 Accelerando, and it was a film about a 25th century female astronaut who uh, was coming to this planet to seed interstellar consciousness. And it was this, also this, this intensity, this accelerated space towards 2020. And now it feels, here we are, you know, we're at this stage, and it is where, where we're getting it, that we are part of the cosmos. And how do we, and what does that mean, right? So that it's really about that, that we are that sacred space, but how do we get there? How, how, you know, what, what do we do to get there? 
And most of my work over the years has been about that. Uh, started with sacred geometry, um, really an understanding of alignments between the body, the earth, and the cosmos. And um, I'll start with, um, with the, the, one of the things I, I thought about before speaking tonight was what my very first sacred space was, a very first experience of sacred space. Uh, I was about five years old, and I, was, uh, I lived in a Catholic convent in North Africa in Carthage. A lot of you know the story, but, um, and um, I was racing from um, the school, and I was going down the hill past the gardens, past grapevines, and I was going towards this grotto, and I fell. And as I opened my eyes, I saw the blue, and it completely, completely enveloped me, completely caressed me, and then I saw the stars. And it was a grotto, and it was a grotto of the Virgin Mary, and it was a place that I would go to to, to have that kind of, um, it, was, it was my sacred space. And then every day on a ritual we would have, um, at five in the morning and at five in the afternoon, we would go to, to, to the chapel and we would pray. And then there was like at 340 and 340, there was the, the sound of the, the Islamic, the mosque going on. So there was this constant, this constant ritual, right? This constant from sunrise to sunset on a daily level and then this, this connection to the sacred. And so um, that, was, that was kind of um, a beginning, a beginning of, of understanding uh, what, what that was. And then, well, I'll go back to we are sacred space, light, and, and light being from, the, from starlight and access, and the idea of, of having access to, to the stars, being in alignment to the stars. Um, then there is the idea of sacred earth and of stellar light, and that we're the connection. We are that space in between sa sacred earth and stellar light. And when I read quite a few years ago about uh, Eve Klein cl claiming the sky, um, and Armand was claiming plenitude, and I asked myself, what do I claim? And I realized that what I claim is this, is the relationship between the earth and the sky. And that all my work was gonna be about this relationship. And in doing that, I then really understood that it was the human, right? That it was the human, that we are that, that connection between the two. And in being, having that kind of alignment, we then become that light. We've, we've forgotten that. Um, a long time ago, when I was about 10, uh, I'll read this, it's a little thing I wrote. When I was 10 years old, playing in the mud, I used to think we were all like little blades of grass. I had a sense that there was a memory that we had forgotten, that needed to be remembered. And that the way of getting there was that for each one of us to dig deep within our roots and that we would come back, so we're little blades of grass, we'd dig deep into our roots and we'd come back, and each one of the blades of grass would be a mirror. But it was through that collective uh, mirroring that we would get the image that we'd forgotten and that we were, would be able to move on. Well, that was many decades ago, but now is the time, right? Now is the time where we're really at that time of the collective and we're at that time of acknowledgement and we're at that time of really understanding who we are in, in the greater context. And then in 2003, I wrote a text called Genius Remembered. And Genius is um, actually from um, uh, a, a definition in the dictionary. It's of a, of a tutelary being who comes to Earth to help the human through, through our lives. Um, but I also, I did it differently. For me, Genius is three different fonts. G-E-N is our genealogy. Um, G I is all there is. And us is us. Genius remembered. 
our genealogy, the all there is, and the us remembered. So it's the idea of to get to the time where it's through th that, that it's the memory of who we are as a whole and who we are individually in, in, in remembrance. So I wrote this text, and there's quite a bit to it, but I just, um, I'm just reading this one part that came into a lot of my work. Um, the text was written in 2003, but it came into my work in 2014, is when I, or 2012, I begun about the, the female astronaut who comes to this planet. So it says, um, we were called the star keepers, as in guardian of the stars. We did not come from any solar system, planet, or galaxy. We are free-floating beings in between lives and in space, in the space between time, and we exist to make sure all the suns, stars, and galaxies are in working order, are taken care of. We were also to take the nectar from each star, the soul seed, or the core star, and disperse it throughout solar systems. We were taught to master precision through our hearts, and we learned to take on many forms for our seeding. We do not live in any gravitational field, except when through the gentleness of an angelic being, we're touched on the soles of our feet. Then, and only then, do we go straight down to whatever planet needs us. We are to seed stellar consciousness into every corner of the cosmos. We were called upon to help those who had forgotten, who no longer held a memory of the time that they had held the understanding that each particle of the cosmos affects every particle. We come into time, into presence, so that we may seed those lands and those beings that have not been touched yet by what is ingrained in our soul. As above, so below. We have come down numerous times through the help of an gentle angelic beings touching the sole of our feet. We have come down to spread those four words until they become a part of everyone's understanding. And we have sent numerous emissaries through time. And now there are thousands of us gently descending, carrying the core star in our arms with our souls to the ground into different time zones, exchanging the breath of life into the mouths of those who are dying, exchanging the breath of whisper into the ears of those that are open. There was a time when 7,066 of our spacecrafts were encircling the Earth. There was a time when those spacecrafts contained manuscripts that carried the wisdom of the ages, and we were to bring those secrets. We carry with us the soul seed of each particle in our hearts. We carry with us a core star in our arms to exchange it with those down below. We have been trained to interchange and bring it to whoever needs us. We're trained to scan each particle the way one reads a book, and we're taught to make each particle transparent, reflective, and interchange those in our being with those in the cosmos. At night, in the middle of the night, her task was to fill the boats with the manuscripts. There were hundreds of them, these ships of the night, and thousands of the manuscripts filled them. She was to go there in the middle of the night where no one but the presence of the sea and the stars out there, out there, and she would begin her task. She was to wait in the darkness in the deepest of the darkness and listen to the breathing of the sea. When the breath was good, when it was the correct exhale and inhale, the ships would slip in between and start floating. They would slip in between each breath and start sailing, just like that, into the space of darkness, between the inhale and exhale of the sea, just like that, into the darkness of space. That was her task then a long time ago then, into the future now, and then into the now. So these kinds of writings is what informs my work. <laughs> um, so it seems very, um, to, to these beings, right, it seems natural that the Earth is just a sculpture in space. And so we can look at it and we can imagine 
many, many things with it. So I wanted to begin with, um, this is a, a temple at Chinchen Itza. And um, the reason I show this is that the first time I went there, which was in 1985, as I climbed up the, the steps and, and stood right in that square rectangle, I could see the circle of the horizon of the earth below me. And I really understood that these places were perhaps where priests used to go to become that conduit between heaven and earth. And, and that's that kind of alignment that at that time it was priesthood, but now it's, it's us, right? Now our bodies contain that space. Um, these are just shots of looking around, seeing, again, the horizon below. Um, this is also a shot of um, the observatory there. So not only did they have a temple, but they also had an observatory. So the idea of stellar um, observation has always been very, very important in, in Mesoamerica and in many other cultures. This is the, the observatory. And then I go to um, just a, um, a view outside my childhood home in North Africa and the horizon. And then a view outside the Catholic convent where I grew up, uh, where there were these, these Roman columns um, that were part of the uh, Roman baths, the ruins of the Roman baths, that to me were like sentinels to the sea observing this kind of eternal kind of space. And then this is uh, here in Malibu, and then more. So it was always that thing of the body, uh, our, ourselves in relationship to, to space, that, that when you're in that kind of alignment, then you access information. Uh, one of the pieces that I did at the time, this was in 1978, um, I just call rock and pigment installation. And it was the first piece that I aligned the rocks to uh, the stars above. So this was my first interest in in, in doing that. Um, I had made marks that were to different points on the earth, to the horizon line or the sun or the earth or the moon. Um, then these are details. Uh, in 1980, I did this project at the Washington Monument, uh, which then it became not only our bodies, but certain monuments become that connection between, between heaven and earth. So the idea was to, uh, th I, had, I, had, um, I had had a, a vision of seeing a red pyramid in the interior of the earth, and the, and the Washington Monument seemed to be placed that to locate it. So I traced the shadow of the monument at north, east, and west, and filled it with red pigment. And, uh, so this is what happened. Um, in 1980, I did Spine of the Earth, which uh, is, comes from um, the idea of sitting in, the, in, sitting in the middle of a cross, which is in the middle of a spiral, which is in the middle of a circle, which is in the middle of a square and a diamond. And through that, you get uh, that kind of an alignment as well. It's kind of hard to see. Here, uh, this is from an airplane. So you can see, you can see what that that geometry was, which you couldn't see when you were down below. Um, years later, I did. I was asked to redo this project for Pacific Standard Time, and this time uh, I did it with a skydiver who went directly down on that point. At, so that. It, she landed on a dime. And <laughs> so instead of just redoing pigment, I, I utilized people to do the, the project that, that I wanted to do. And so 300, about 200 people dressed in red uh, spiraled around her and then went down 287 steps. This is not too far from here. It's in Culver City uh, in a place called um, the, uh, the Overlook. So what I wanted to 
emphasize now are two projects that I did that have to do with that idea that, that uh, we are sacred space and how to get to that sacred space. In the 90s, I did a lot of public projects and one of them was at the Palace Virtus, Virtus, Palace Virtus Central Library and it was called Stellar Axis. And um, there was a, a viewing tube that went 13 feet outside the building and would, the sun would come twice, uh, twice a year on, on uh, August 13th and March 27th and align to this onyx piece that I did on the, on the floor. Um, this is looking up at the, at the solar tube. And then there were four floors of space that metaphoric or symbolically, I would bring the light in so that each, each level had um, a reflective stone that then reflected I also had a dome that was uh, gold leaf, so it reflected that uh, beneath it. And, it um, and then on the wall, there was a curved wall where I gold leafed it, but then had um, writings about what was seen through that, through that tube, and it talked about um, in, in ancient times looking up at the sky and, and what, what that brought. Um, I then go to... Um, the, the Stellar Access Project, which was, came out of, um, um, I, I spent a lot of time in Egypt, and when I was there, I had, a, I, I, I had a image that came to my mind that was of the earth from space that had nothing on it but gold-tipped pyramids all aligned to the stars. And it was an incredible image that, of course, I couldn't do, I couldn't do those pyramids, but I wanted to do points of stars on the Earth. And it took many years to figure out how I was going to do that, and I decided to start at the North and South Poles to get that kind of, again, to get that kind of light coming through. Um, so these just showing the galaxy. And then the idea was that as starlight would fall at the North Pole and then at the South Pole, through the rotation of the Earth, it would, it would form what looked like the double strand of the DNA. So that meant that light was connected through the axis of the Earth, but also connected us to our DNA. It was a visualization of that idea. And I did many projects about that. Um, these are some sketches. Um, so, I said, we are the sacred space, the earth is the sacred space as well. So, again, through that alignment, what I was trying to get there was that through that alignment, we're bringing in uh, the light. And um, so, you see it there. I've never used this kind of thing. Um, um, and so that to, someone asked me, you know, why do you, how, why do you think, why do you do global projects? Why do you do them on that scale? And it is because through the writing, I've trained myself to think in those terms, to think in terms of being one of those beings, um, being able to see all these different uh, planetary systems. And so for me, it's, it is like a sculpture in space and that we really are in space. Um, so then I did some very um, funky drawings of how it relates to the body and through the chakra system and that kind of alignment of through, through the rotation of the stars at the North Pole and the South Pole and our bodies through our chakras and how that Oops, I just did something, okay. Um, um, and then these are drawings of that idea of bringing in light and how to connect them.
so it was, um, I, I was really obsessed with, with doing this and with the idea of aligning to the stars. And then we actually uh, went there. This, this is a simulation of seeing how it affected through, through the Earth. But then we actually went there. And uh, these are some of the shots. Uh, this is this is in Antarctica, in on the Ross Ice Shelf. How, how did we get the discs or the spheres here, and what are they made um, of? There were ninety nine of them, and I use the the number ninety nine quite a bit because it's the idea of that it's not a closed system, that it's that it's still open, uh, but it's also based on um, the Islamic the ninety nine names of God. And um, they, we did them in halves and created them and shipped them from Oxnard to Christchurch and then airlifted them from Christchurch to, to uh, Antarctica. And then we had to carry them in big trucks that we had to learn how to drive and ice and then went out in the middle of nowhere and slept in tents. and. Uh, put them out there. And there was a team of only five of us, and um, um, we did that for 11 days. And it was 24 hours of daylight, so we, we were, you know, we were doing this constantly on, on the whole thing. And it was, it's, they're made out of fiberglass. Is the weather The weather, in fact, did cooperate. It was really, uh, what happened is it, it would get, at times it was, it was warm enough that we didn't need to have our heavy coats. Other times I thought I was dying of, of cold. But the way it cooperated in that, at the, I wanted a clear, you know, once we had done it, I wanted it to look really so that the footsteps wouldn't get, be part of it. And we came back and it had snowed and it looked amazing. So it kept, it kept doing, yeah, I had a lot of luck with doing these outdoor projects. Yeah. You have to remove everything. So how do you remove that? Yes. Uh, we, in Antarctica, you, you, there's a treaty where you have to take, we ha you have to take, a, what you bring in, you have to take out. You cannot leave it on the continent. So they were only going to let us keep them for a couple days. And I said, no, can we keep them longer? So we were able to keep them three weeks. We were hoping to kind of pretend they weren't there and leave them there forever. But <laughs> so we had to take them down. So we took them down and, and shipped them back. So that was. Is it a for that or e that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, when I had the idea of, of wanting to go to the North and South Poles, no one was talking about the Poles at the time. This was way before all of that conversation. And I had no idea how to get there. And we did a lot of research. I even thought I was going to go with a flat, with a hollow earth society and go down the North Pole, down, down a hole. I mean, I was going to do whatever it took, whatever it took to get me there. I, I actually, you know, went almost, almost did that expedition. Um, and then I work with an astronomer and he, who had been at the South Pole for a year. He did, um, uh, he was there doing astronomy through the National Science Foundation. And his girlfriend knew that the National Science Foundation did grants for artists. There was a program called the Artists and Writers Program. And so we applied, uh, we got it immediately, and then they changed who it was, and it took us three years to be able to actually go. Uh, but it was a grant, and so they don't give you money, but they completely take care of you. They, they send you there, they take care of the shipping, the whole, and, and we were the largest team. Um, I was telling someone earlier how I was very lucky in the same year Werner Herzog got the same grant. And when I went to Colorado for the logistics to get, the, I opened the door and there, there he was, uh, part, of the, part of the team. So that was, that, was a real, that was a real thrill to be there at the same time. And that's when he did uh, his film. Um, 
not, not the Cape Forgotten Dreams, I'm forgetting the name of it now, but it was a film that he did there. And he had wanted to shoot what I was doing, but we sort of crossed schedule-wise, so that was impossible. But anyway, it was great. Um, so yes, it was, uh, it was an amazing experience, and uh, a lot of it had to do with the quality of light that was there. Uh, I also, six months later, I actually ended up going to the North Pole. I received um, uh, a, um, I was, I, I applied for an artist in residence program aboard a Russian nuclear icebreaker. And uh, for my pay, I would teach the, the, the tourists there how to draw polar bears, but I got to be there. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> And, and, you know, say, hey, do you want to be part of my performance? And they were the ones who then, we did a performance with the motion of the stars at, at the North Pole. Um, so, yeah, that was, uh, I'll keep showing slides of this. Did you learn to speak Russian? No, Payanamo, I guess that's how you say it. <laughs> Bad, <laughs> no. <laughs> There was um, an entire team of Russians. They, they were all Russians who did it. The ice specialist was Russian, the whole thing. It was pretty great. Uh, anyway, so these are, whoops, I go again. Uh, so, so, what, so we placed them, I worked with the astronomer, and we placed them in alignment to the stars above. So it was the idea of creating um, this, this alignment and to do the same at the North Pole so it would create this shaft of light that was poetically that would come through the, the center of the earth. And so what you're seeing are different constellations. Uh, this is from the air. Um, and of the 99 brightest stars in the sky um, at, at the time there on December 22nd, which is um, the solstice. And then six months later, uh, I went to, on this Russian icebreaker, and this is, uh, they had a helicopter so we could take pictures of what we look like uh, going through um, the ice, and the only way that we knew we got to the North Pole was by 90 degrees north, which was an extraordinary feeling to be at the top of the globe. Um, and then I did engage the, the um, tourist to be part of this performance where they ended up moving like the motion of the stars at, at the poles. And I was able to do one sphere at exactly 90 degrees north, which was uh, very exciting. Um, so that was that was the that that shows you what what how the work has to do with that kind of alignment. Um, and then I'm showing you one last project, which is called Transparent Earth. I did this. Um, in, in um, S Switzerland, and it's the 25th century female astronaut who, not the exact same sculpture that was at, at um, the Annenberg uh, in, uh, for Desert X, but, um, and so she is lying there listening to the earth, but the idea is that the whole piece is that there will be another another, a mirror image of her at, at the antipode, which means at the other side of, of the world. Um, and in this case, uh, it ends at the bottom of the ocean off the coast of New Zealand. And that's a project we're working on right now. And this shows you um, the, the, what she is like in Switzerland right now. and where she will be uh, this coming, well, in, in a year from now.
So. The scale is, is life scale, is a, yeah, just life scale. So that when you, the people hike to her and what's, it's, it's very intimate, right? It's just this human being and it looks like a human, but it's blue. So it looks, so it's an image. And so there is this interesting, both intimacy and, and not, um, that gives it uh, a really, it, it, it has, it, it has that kind of, almost sci-fi and yet not, and yet intimate. And people have told me that they, they go to see the blue lady. You know, they, they think of it as a very... It was not damaged in all this time? It, it did get some damage with the snow, yes. But not it by did. the people? No, not, no, no, not, not by the people. Yeah, which is, yeah, kind of amazing. Um, that's what I brought for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. If you have questions. Thank you so much, Lita. I, I see we're all physically still here on Earth, <laughs> but I feel definitely that we're transported elsewhere. And I would actually just love to, I know there are probably more questions. I would love to hear how um, you get outside the space of the, of the planet to oh. actually imagine the cosmos, because I feel like that's um, such a unique, a difficult place to get to. Yeah. Oh, you can use your mic. Oh, I have it. I like to hold that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for reminding me. I, I had notes and I forgot. Um, okay. One of the ways that I do it is very simple. Um, and it's a, it's a practice that I do daily. Um, and it is um, today is Thursday, December 12th of the year 2019 at 717 p.m. Uh, at the Bridge Project in Hollywood, um, Los Angeles, California, United States of America, Western Hemisphere, planet Earth, uh, in the solar system existing in the Orion arm of the Milky Way galaxy next to, in, in, in our Milky Way, next to the Virgo cluster of galaxies, next to the Super cluster, next to the Lanakei cluster. Then from the Lanakei cluster, uh, back to the Super Great Cluster, to the Virgo cluster, to the Milky Way, to the Orion, Orion arm, to our solar system, to, our, to planet Earth, to the Northern Hemisphere, Western Hemisphere, to the United States of America, to the America, to the Americas, the United States of America, to the state of California, to uh, Los Angeles, to Hollywood, to the Bridge Project, at 7:18 p.m. And I would do this. I would I would actually do this maybe 30, 40 times a day, uh, and so to the point where I remember certain things, like driving in my blue Dodge van, you know, in the middle of the road, or being on the corner or being on a donkey in Egypt in the Valley of the Kings or being swimming in Jaipur, uh, certain things have stuck to me. So I, I'm very, what I'm interested in is presencing the moment. And so when you say, you know, how, you know, how do we get there? We, we are there, right? We are in outer space. And, um, and so it's, it's so, a lot of people say, oh, it's so metaphysical. It's not so physical. I mean, it's, it's physics, right? It is what, where we're at now. Now, we just don't have that kind of, but so it's, it's practice. And then I do these um, meditations, the energetic meditations that I do, again, on a daily basis, uh, when I can, when I sound on a daily basis. It used to be on a daily basis. I don't live by the ocean anymore, so, but I go to the beach and I, I, um, I'm running on the beach and I do what I call the arc meditation, which is, and these just came to me one day as I was running, um, of inhaling from the sun to my heart and exhaling from my heart to the sun, inhaling from the sun to my heart, exhaling, and I do that 10 times. And then I do the arc meditation, what I call the arc meditation, which is uh, I spread out no, I'm sorry, the arc meditation was that, um, which is like living geometry, because as you do that at different times during the day, 
uh, if you do it at different times during the day, the circle, the arc be is, is different. So you understand the geometry. It's always in relationship to the sun. And then I do what I call the dome meditation, which is holding the horizon of the ocean there, the base of the, of the mountain. And then I used to do Kundalini yoga. So I do what's called breath of fire as I kick my heels up and as I'm running. And I do 33 breath of fires. And then I go back 10, then 30, then 10, then 30 until I've done 99 and, and, um, and 40. And then I kind of let it all out. And then I do, uh, I'm still running. And then I do, um, I let the breath out. And on the exhale, I um, imagine a spiral motion going through all my chakras and then back down and then back up. And that kind of seals it. And I, again, I, sometimes I did it three times a day, but once a day is, is good. Um, so all these practices, I think it came out a lot of, I, having had that experience as a child, living in a convent, having that kind of ritual, that daily practice of the, the sunrise, the sunset, and you're there to a greater thing, a greater, um, you're in constant relationship to the, the greater outside. How I came to, you know, really going out in space more, um, I think just came from, I think that's why the library was so important. You know, I'd done a lot of readings, I did a lot of writing, like the, the writings that I read at the Philosophical Research uh, Center a couple weeks ago um, is what I call automatic writing. Um, I don't know, I could read one if I could. Again, I did this fairly daily at a point, um, and thank goodness my daughter did grab some of these notebooks. Uh, they were, mo but the ones that were handwritten uh, were gone, but this, this I have a few years. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so this is one of them. So this is automatic writing, which does come out of that kind of saying, the time and space. Okay, this is May 4th, 1993 from the Marina Studio, California, 12, 12 p.m., May 4th, 1993. As we have told you, go ahead and leap from your trapeze into the clear space of blue, into the clear blue space. This morning you did the arc meditation beautifully. You're getting it. The dance is from one rim rotation to another. The rim of the ellipse of the arc meditation is equal to the rim of the movement of the planet Earth in space. This is May 4th, 1993, from the Marina Studio, California, 1.16 p.m. Rim rotations, ellipses, ellipses in space, from the heart to the sun, from the sun to your heart, right through your heart. The planet is named Earth because it is a listening system, an ear to the heart. But most people have forgotten that. That was its origin. It was its original purpose, the origin of its existence. The planet Earth as an ear to the universe. The universe as a gigantic heart. The sun as a microcosm of the heart of the universe. Ear, heart. This is the time to reconnect with the origin of the purpose of the planet which was to be an instrument of listening. It is important to remember the distinction of listening to the heart. The heart is our origin. The heart is our source. The distinction of planet Earth as a reminder of the heart, as a reminder of our origin, as a reminder of our source. We have come back. We have come back in swarms by the thousands to remind you to go back to listening. It is the time to remember. It is the time to re-listen. It is the time to listen. Intuition is a listening system. It is also the time to reconnect with the intuitive system. This is how we work then. There was a network of listening systems in the Earth planet connected to places throughout the universe. And it was known fact that the planet Earth was a listening system for the heart. It was its distinctions. Everyone was connected to that listening system. 
The power spots of the Earth function like stethoscopes to the universe. That is why there's so much information embedded in those places, and that is why there's such interest in them now. We're coming in swarms by the thousands to remind you of who you are. You are the direct listening system to the source, to the heart in process of becoming all heart. As above, so below. Universal laws are there as a process. They are living organisms. As above, so below. As a concept is in process of becoming. The earth is in process of becoming what it is listening to. We're all in process of becoming what we're listening to. It is important to listen to the right thing, is it not? <laughs> so that's one of them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Any more questions? Yes, yeah. Larry. Yeah, that particular one, there were 287 steps. Uh, it's called the Baldwin Hill Scenic Overlook. And so that's, that, that's a different kind of numbering system than, than I usually do. Um, the 99 is really important. And, and 33 and 144, they're, they're kind of magical uh, symbol, symbolic numbers. Um, but in that case, it, was, it had to do with the steps. But was it from a vision that you had to instigate that, that presentation? Well, you know, it's interesting that you should ask that question. So the Getty Museum wanted me to redo Spine of the Earth, which was the pigment piece, right, that was the spiral that you saw. And we were going to redo it in the desert, and I was going to have the one difference I was going to do is have the skydivers do that. But then they said, no, we can't do it in the desert. There are not other artists doing it, so we couldn't be, bring people there. You have to find a spot in the city. So when I found, um, when I found the, the scenic overlook, um, I was thinking of pouring pigment down the stairs. You know, I was going, what am I going to do there? You know, like it's, and then I had been impressed, very impressed forever, with seeing people pray at Mecca. And so the idea of a lot of people. So I thought, well, what if I use people instead of pigment? That's how that began. It began, it wasn't a vision, it was... Problem solving. Problem solving, yeah. It was loving that image. The, uh, the idea of many people. That was, that was like, important. Steffi. I, I'm just curious if you, um, the Washington Monument piece, what was it like getting permission to do something like that at the Washington Monument? And the other question I have is like, can you give us a sense of how deep that was and how much pigment you used? I mean, your pieces, they, they last for a while, so you must use a lot of pigment. Could you just talk a little bit about the actual physical making of that? That particular piece? Or yeah. any piece? And, and in general. But yeah, yeah I'm curious just, about the Washington Monument. Yeah, I just ordered three tons of powder pigment to go to Saudi Arabia. So, um, so I'm about to do another star map there um, with three tons of powder pigment. So yes, it, it has, there is a lot of, of depth to that. In terms of the Washington Monument and the permission, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling either guided or incredibly blessed that I've been able to do these projects in places of political power, right? Um, and here I'm putting, I'm interested in spiritual power. So it's really interesting to have that intersection of spiritual power in places of political power. Um, so with the Washington Monument, um, first let me tell you how the piece came about and then I'll tell you how I got permission. So the piece came about um, by two dreams. The concept came from two dreams that I had. One of them was that I was flying over the Southwest and I saw a very long pole that stuck way deep in the ground and web high and cast a huge shadow. And in the dream, it was the first 33 years of my life was on one side and the other on the next. And then there was another, it wasn't a dream, it was just a vision of seeing this red pyramid in the interior of the earth. And so when I was asked to do 
an ephemeral piece for the International Sculptural Conference. It was part of that. I asked, where was it going to be? They said, on the Washington Mall. At that time, I hadn't been to Washington, so I studied you know, exactly where I thought, I mean, I knew what it was, but where it was, and I saw the Washington Monument. And I, I realized, OK, I'm going to do, th that's the pole, and I'm going to do um, a shadow. I'm going to cover the shadow of the monument in blue pigment so that at one point in time, it would just align and then go, how ephemeral can you get, until I realized that it's at least 55 feet uh, wide by it could be a couple thousand feet. So I thought, and then I remembered the, the red pyramid vision. So I thought, OK, I will do this metaphysical fantasy of using the monument to locate this red pyramid in the interior of the Earth. So that's how that came about. So then um, I was very lucky in having Marsha Wiseman as a real patron. Uh, she was a, an incredible patron here in Los Angeles uh, back in the 70s, and, and this was 1980, so in the 70s. And um, she uh, talked to Walter Hopps and said, you know, Lita wants to do this project, but I had to go through all this red tape. So I thought I, w I had a model of the monument, and, f and I brought sod from California, and it was in the middle of the winter. And um, I, I was in a space like this where I'm making a presentation and there's a friend of mine in the back who is going, you're not getting it, Lita, it's not happening. <laughs> oh, God. So if I take them outside, I put the Washington Monument down, my little model, I put the sod down, I cut out the triangles, and I put in red pigment, and I said, oh, oh, yeah, you can do that, right? <laughs> That's, that's how that happened, yeah. But I, had, I obviously had a lot of support behind me, but still, that was how that happened. Yes, Edward. Peter, uh, I do remember, if I remember correctly, that when you told me about this project years ago, and yeah. I was absolutely amazed and amused with that, you told me that you had permission, you had to turn everything back to normal yeah. almost in 24 hours. <laughs> Do I remember yes, correctly? So all this gigantic project and logistic, and you just made it, you photographed it, and you were responsible for completely eliminating it and putting it back to what it used to be Yes. in 24 hours. That's amazing. I, you know, I continue to do this. I continue to do projects that take me months and months and sometimes years to think out the logistics, all the people, the financial aspect, all that, and then it's for a moment. But then, you know. But this is for magic moment. A magic moment. Thank you, Edward. <laughs> that's good. So you had a question. Lita, you mentioned the, uh, the double helix in, in, in the context of your art project. Uh, wait, wait, I mentioned the what? The, the, the double helix DNA. DNA. The double helix, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, right. So, uh, did you use that uh, in, in the sense of connecting it to a line? And the more complex alignment. Did you use that in other pieces or in the project? I, I did. I did. I did a, a video actually that 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 showed that. Um, yes, I did. And and when when I realized that you know that if you take two stars there and two stars there and you through the rotation of the Earth, it has that. So we're our DNA is connected to the stars, which we know is. But to have that to when I. It was such a, a moment, uh, a really exciting moment to have that, to see that. Um, I was curious with the stellar access project, since you went to things. Uh, both poles, whether both personally and within your own process, there was any marked difference in um, being in the inhabited North Pole in which you also uh, worked with people as a material and the uninhabited South. Well, you know, they, they're called polar, you know, you, you hear the term polar opposites. I mean, it really is, you know, the North Pole and the opposite of the South Pole. I'm not sure I'm quite understanding your question, but the, uh, in Antarctica, we had the experience of both, right? We had the experience of the research stations where we had total um, access to, and we were and, and complete support, meaning heat and equipment and all of that. So we had 
uh, a whole system supporting us to, to be there. And that's another thing that I learned. You know, you learn about our interdependency. And it's, it's not until you get to a place like that that you see how you're not alone, right? You, you cannot function alone. You're completely part of all these systems that permit you to have a life, essentially. And, and that was like really a big lesson of that. But so we would go to these places that were not habited, right, where we were out in the middle of nowhere. But we had this enormous system uh, behind us. I remember they had given us Scooby-Doo's, you know, these things that you can wheel around in, and which was a lot of fun. And then I come back and I could hear the generator, this giant generator, and I realized that my life depended on that. You know, that was kind of an amazing experience. At the North Pole, the system was the Russian icebreaker. There's nothing at the North Pole. It's water and ice. So I'm not sure I'm answering your question. Uh, in regards to the North, I guess I was referencing the inhabitants of the Inuit tribes and their sovereignty over the land there. Um, and curious whether in like, the large system that you're referring to, whether it was more through the sovereignty of the whatever system icebreaker represented and carrying you through to a place of desolation or inhabitation in the North Pole um, in a region that is largely inhabited but not always visibly so. Um, but just the, the idea of like stellar light passing through the Oh, oh, and, and, and that idea. Yeah. Um, it was much more at, in, at the South Pole, it, much more in, in Antarctica in that the qual one of those polar opposite things that I certainly observed, I haven't really read about that, but the quality of light, it felt like each particle of light there was carried a, a lot more light than it did at the North Pole. And I don't know what, maybe it's the fact that it's a continent and therefore there's reflected light from the ice, uh, but there was a very, so the idea of, of that access and having light enter into our system. I don't think I felt it at the North Pole. I, I definitely felt it uh, in, in Antarctica, but at the North Pole, um, well, we were in this system of the ship and everybody was excited to be there. I was never by myself completely, so that could be something, um, but it didn't have the same quality of light. And it's interesting because um, when I do the automatic writing, um, I don't know if, if he's still here, but my assistant, Marcus, I don't see him. Um, when he first heard that I, I was doing that, he says, oh, can you do it, can you do it? And, and I couldn't just do it right then and there. And he was kind of shocked that I couldn't just do it there. And I said, no, it has to be in a place where I can, you know, feel it, where I can receive it. And, and so it's, it's, it's it, yeah, there's different, and I think that's why power spots are called power spots, because it's those places where there's certain energies that you can feel a lot more, yeah. But, but so to go back to, you know, we are at this sacred space, and now is the time. I think, I, I mean, it sounds, you know, I think it's, I, I know it's really, important and it's really a time to regain, remember, you know, that, that access and, and um, there's, and the, 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 the idea of star alignment is one, the idea of anything that has to do with where you can listen, it really is about listening. And I think part of the thing that happens well, that happened to me as a young child being raised in a convent was that I had this enormous interior life because there wasn't anything but, you know, God in my, in my surrounding and prayer and nature. And so I think that's how we, we need, to, how we navigate towards that, that sense of how to connect, like I, can ask you, you know, like what was the first, what was your first uh, sacred space that you experienced? I mean, I just thought about it yesterday when, when I thought of 
speaking here and, and coming and seeing that the grotto with the blue cloak and you know what what is that what was your first sacred space and and how did you feel and how do you find that again you know how do you connect with that it could be anything well i think that's a very good question okay and it's, I, it's a very good thing to for each of us to leave thinking about and um you know kind of allowing that question to dissolve into us and yes and um, consider. Um, thank you, Lita. Thank you. We really appreciate you. your presence here. Thank you very much.